Hey guys, if you're shopping for knives and gear, make sure you check out the description of the video you're watching right now for a link to my Amazon store, where I've compiled some of the very best items available, including some of my own personal recommendations. Thanks! What's going on? YouTube Metal Complex here, and today I have a super interesting knife review slash knife overview to share with you guys. Um, this is the actual uh, Andrew Demko MG AD15. Uh, to, uh, to clarify, because I know somebody will ask, uh, when I posted this uh, knife on Instagram, somebody said, how did you get a titanium AD15? And the question puzzled me for a second, then I realized, oh, most people know the 8015 uh, from the Cold Steel variant. So Andrew Demko was the uh, is the uh, man behind the triad lock um, uh, through Cold Steel, right? So his uh, I mean his he's I imagine getting continuous royalties from that, but he also has he also makes his own knives and creates his own designs, and in this case his own another type of lock. But the uh, the 8015 is his design. And so uh, Cold Steel manufactures it, or rather, the, I mean, in, in, it's manufactured in Taiwan so people can get their hands on it for a substantially lower price. This is the actual AD15. Now, it's my understanding, by the way, when I said MG, uh, that means machine ground, um, and, and it's in reference to the blade. There are elements of this knife that have hand finish work and hand detail, you know, like assembly and fine tuning, things like that. Uh, and then there are some machine elements. Now, the way that I define this is mid-tech, but people define things how they're going to define them. I would imagine that there are variants of this knife that are legitimately full custom by uh, Andrew Demko, but I have no idea. So the way that I'm going to define this is mid-tech bordering on custom. Um, but this is, the, uh, this is the real deal here. These come in a few different variations at a, at a few different price points. You can get a combination of G10 or Micarta. Uh, starting at prices uh, around $675, you can get uh, carbon fiber in this area where you're seeing titanium uh, for, I think, something around $725, $750. And then the highest priced ones that I'm seeing are the full titanium variants, which is what you're seeing here. And these are about $825. Yes, they are very expensive. That's uh, when, you're, when they're manufactured in the United States and you're using materials like titanium and you're going above and beyond with the fit and finish and you know, the, the extra details that a, a hu there's human interaction, human labor and hours gone into this thing. Yeah, the price is going to go substantially higher. I wish I did have a cold steel one here to compare it with, but I have actually reviewed it. I've handled the knife and I remember what it feels like. You can go back and check out that review if you'd like to. But anyways, this knife was sent to me like many others by herms.things on Instagram. Give him a follow. It's because of people like him that I'm able to bring you guys daily knife content. It's also because of people like my generous patrons. So thank you much. Uh, thank you so much to my generous patrons. If you'd like to check out my Patreon, there's a link down in the description. You can get your hands on some stickers and other exclusive content. So uh, the support would mean the world to me. Let's go ahead and measure this guy coming in. Um, I think the measurements are all going to be exactly the same as the uh, cold steel variant. Just a hair, or maybe it's right on. Nope, it's right on eight and a half inches. The overall blade length is coming in at 3.75. Cutting edge is coming in at exactly three and a half. This is what I would call a big knife for a lot of reasons. Let's go ahead and do some size comparisons. Up against the Ontario Rat Model 1. Rat 1's coming in at 8.6 inches overall. How about up against the Spyderco PM2? Spyderco PM2 coming in at 8.3 inches overall. How about up against the Benchmade Gratillion, or in this case, the Ritter Hogue? Ritter Hogue coming in at eight inches overall. And last but not least, the Spyderco Para 3. Para 3 coming in at seven and a quarter inches overall. How is the action on this guy? <laughs> I'm going to sit down for this. The action is incredible. <laughs> um, so this Scorpion lock, you've got uh, this, this pivot back here. And then there's tension that's causing it to snap back into place. But this bar rides around this back roller area, the tang of the blade, kind of like an axis bar on a Benchmade knife. It is incredibly smooth to the point where it will almost fall shut. It just barely takes a little bit of a kick to get it to fall. Now, I was going to save this for the end of the review, but um, this is as good a time as any to explain to you guys part of the reason why it's so smooth. For a little bit there, I thought, is that on bearings? No, it doesn't feel like bearings. So I thought, well, it's obviously it's phosphor bronze. Well, <laughs> I'm going to disappoint a lot of people. I hope you guys hang around for the whole review. Um, but in here, it's actually, sorry, let me, um, let me change the flashlight mode here to something other than 
Power of the Sun. Where is that little black flashlight that I am always missing? It's buried, I'm sure, underneath. Oh, there it is. Goodness. Sometimes a simple flashlight, guys. That's all it takes. Okay, anyways. Yeah, it's running on nylon. Now, I understand um, the knife community's view on nylon for the most part. Not everybody thinks this way, but most people will go, nylon, but, because they associate it directly with um, CRKT or some CRKT knives. Gerber um, and a lot of low-end knives, especially the jet like the gas station knives. Yes, the washers are inexpensive to manufacture, but that's not the idea here. When you see high-end knives on nylon washers, it's not an opportunity for the maker to save money. <laughs> They're not saving hardly anything. The benefit of the nylon washers is that like phosphor bronze, it keeps the debris out of the pivot area but they are, in most cases, smoother, especially when all of the tolerances are perfect. The drawback to them is that they are substantially more frail than phosphor bronze, but it only affects them if a piece of debris gets in there that is hard enough to sit right on top of that washer and somehow the friction of opening and closing it causes it to drag against the washer and tear it. I have seen exactly two pictures on the entirety of the internet where that has occurred. Um, one was a, uh, a Hinder XM18, Generation 3, I think, and uh, they just gave him some more washers. <laughs> that, was the, that was the end of it there. Um, the other one, I cannot remember for the life of me what it was. What I'm saying here is that it's unbelievably rare. Would it be better if it were phosphor bronze? Oh my gosh, yes. But when I get down, I mean, like, it's, it's my preference of wanting the entire thing to be metal. Because this thing is this hulking mass of titanium and steel. It's so like powerful and, and almost menacing looking, right? Um, I want it to be uh, all metal. And the, the phosphor bronze um, would add to that, you know? And, and certainly that last, you know, 2% of excess durability or, you know, feeling of fortification inside the pivot would help me sleep a little bit better at night, you know, while the knife inevitably gets used for cutting loose threads off of my t-shirt during the day. Um, but uh, it's, it's not the case. So what I'm saying is, is um, I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't allow that to steer you away from this knife. I will say that my preference would be phosphor bronze. Don't let it steer you away because there's so much good here. Uh, there's so much good here and I'm about to explain why. Um, but yeah, that is the case. But my goodness is the action smooth. And let me tell you guys, the action is solid. Another complaint with nylon washers, and this was in hinderer knives, is that the mushiness caused the knife to actually uh, have play, even when it was tight. Well, this guy is smooth, it is centered, absolutely, and it has zero play up, down, left, or right, and that's largely due, I would imagine, to the position of the pins, uh, the stop pins, and the um, scorpion lock, and how it uh, interacts with the, um, the blade here. So... Yeah, no issues there. Uh, let's talk about the Scorpion Lock. Ease of manipulation on this guy. Favorite thing, uh, one of my favorite things, uh, this one versus the Cold Steel variant, is this lock, for whatever reason, is massively uh, easier to um, to interact with. Now, I played with that Cold Steel one, and if you guys watched that video, I messed around with that. I didn't quite have it down. I was like, what is the deal here? It wasn't stiffer. It just had more friction. This guy locks up super hard, but there's no friction. It's just so easy. It's a perfect example of how... Knives like this um, differ greatly from their production counterparts. You know, so many people, you know, um, they, uh, they, they can only afford the production variant, and that's fine, but then they convince themselves it's exactly the same thing, and then it's just greed of the maker causing one item to cost more money. No, that's not the case. There's more that goes into it, right? I mean, it's the exact cost and what it should be, it's all over the place. But truthfully, no, it's little things like this. The ease of disengagement here, it's insane. This thing has its own unique fidget factor, and on top of that, I can actually flick it out. And somebody had me do this on the live stream. Watch this. I can reverse flick it. No way I was doing with that with the Cold Steel one. It just, it, there was too much friction. It's not bad. The Cold Steel variant isn't bad at all. Um, price is going up a little weird, weirdly. <laughs> the price has gone way up since when I first handled it. But, um, but yeah, this is different. This is much smoother. It's much more polished. I really, really like it. And like I said, nearly, nearly falls shut. Really, really cool. Okay, let's talk about a negative here nine minutes into the video. This guy is a enormous. It is thick. It is big. It is heavy. Now, in terms of height here, that's one of the only 
things that's not super bad. I mean, you know, we're talking about similar uh, height to the Spyderco uh, PM2 and overall length, but thickness and weight are an entirely different story. Let's go ahead and get a measurement of thickness on that blade here real quick. Let me zero this out. Okay, blade stock thickness is 183 thousandths. Yeah, at least 180 thousandths. We're talking nearly XM24 thickness on this guy. Now that means something different actually on this guy in the final edge. We're gonna talk about that here, but this is, I mean, despite these open areas, this is solid titanium with a titanium backspacer, the scorpion lock, the thick blade, and it's 8.75 inches overall. So the weight is coming in at, I mean, you know, for an XM24 size knife, um, well, I, I mean, actually the, the weight's fairly similar, I think, to the, what does the XM24 weigh? Seven and a half ounces? Seven ounces. This knife is not going to be a good general EDC knife. This is an outdoor knife. It was designed for that. It was not designed for a casual outing with your friends at a microbrewery <laughs> or a cocktail party, golf club, right? Funeral, birthday party, uh, 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 PTA meeting. No, that's not what this was for. This is for mega hard use if you need the convenience of a knife that folds. Um, this is legitimately a hard use knife. And usually the people who argue with me are cold steel triad lock fans. I have never seen a locking mechanism that has a construction that I would say rivals the cold steel triad lock in durability, except for this. The way that this locks into the blade, look at this. By the way, those bronze marks are heat marks. There's not, it's not rust or there's nothing wrong. The discoloration is usually just heat marks. That's not going anywhere uh, already. It's not going anywhere unless you lift up back here and push forward on the blade. Here's the other reason it's not going anywhere. Okay, right? I'm going to show you guys where your hands are going to go when you use this. It, this is not going to disengage. It will, it will not. It doesn't matter what you're doing with this. Um, there are so many other things on this knife that could potentially break before that lock could break. It's crazy. But here's the thing. I don't know what would break first because the dimensions on this thing all the way around, I mean, the tip's not going to break anytime soon, right? Um, the pivot strength, I mean, it's backed up by uh, the, the enormous, the enormous uh, stop pin and its position being locked into the back, the spine of the blade. I mean, talk about locked in. This thing is legit hard use. Not like, oh, yeah, you can kind of, you know, you can use it, push it into wood. Now, this knife is truly, I mean, the, the only thing I can think of that is t that would be tougher than this knife is a fixed blade, but I almost feel like, you know, a fixed blade that's the same size and thickness would snap at almost the same point, right? I'm not, I'm not actually suggesting that this is as tough as, as a fixed blade, but yeah, I think I can confidently say that this guy is legitimately ready to go. Is it that much more durable than the, uh, the, the tri or the uh, cold steel variant? I don't know, probably not. I mean, if you put all of the value into the durability of the lock, then yeah, just go with a cold steel one, right? I mean, if you don't care about anything else, go with a cold steel one. <laughs> That's fine, I'm not judging you. Um, but yeah, I mean, this thing is absolutely 100% ready to go. 13 minutes in, let's go ahead and do the hardware check here real quick. Um, you got my handy dandy Wea bit selector and Wea magnetic driver, two items that are very inexpensive and very recommendable to everybody. You can find them down in the Amazon store that I reference at the beginning of every video. Um, just pull open the store and look for the knife maintenance category. You should find them pretty easily. I believe, actually no, uh -uh, those are, those look like T10. Let's try it real quick. I do not want to put a mark on this guy because it's clearly very new. Yeah, T10 right there. Look at this, there's nothing on the other side. T10. Right there, and that's it. T10 on the other pivots, right? Now these pocket clip screws are likely T8. Let's take a look here. Yep, T8 pocket clip screws. So you got three of those, and then you got <laughs> the two T10s. I've seen this thing taken apart. I don't think it's overly complicated. Nick Shabazz, of course, has a great disassembly video of, of this knife. So yeah, ease of disassembly is there. And you have the right heads, in my opinion. They're the same size. I mean, what more could you ask for? 
let's go ahead and talk about the um, anatomy of this knife. So here's uh, the main reason that I am aesthetically drawn to it. <laughs> this is exactly the variant that I would pick up for myself. This is monochromatic all the way through with textured titanium. Oh, this is the best type. This diamond pattern textured titanium. Why don't we see this more? This is a milling pattern that could be done on expensive knives or inexpensive knives. I want to see this more. This is wonderful. Why is it wonderful? Because it's smooth enough to slide in and out of the pants pocket, right? But it provides meaningful traction on an otherwise very slippery surface. I mean, yeah, the ergonomic lines of this guy are great and that's what really locks you in, but my goodness, textured titanium. Knife makers, knife manufacturers, please look to the Hinder XM18 uh, texture pattern on the titanium scales and this for reference. This is wonderful. Not everybody enjoys this aesthetically, but to me and to a lot of people, this is aesthetically pleasing the way that it bounces light around, right? And it also is utilitarian. It is wonderful and it is perfectly executed on this knife. I cannot emphasize that enough, guys. This is fantastic. I love this. I also love how he puts his logo on the uh, the pivot. Um, you can see there it says Demco Knives. That's the only billboarding on anything. It's just awesome and it makes, I mean, it's a good way to sort of um, counteract the potential counterfeits out there. I don't think there are a lot of copies of these out there. Scorpion Lock would be hard to replicate, but um, that, that helps out with that. And it looks nice, right? The blade is completely sterile. There were variants of this in S35VN. I've seen them, on, seen them on DLT with 20CV. I don't know what this is. It could be one or the other. Some people prefer 20CV. Some people prefer S35VN. You're going to pay the same amount of money for either, it seems like. I think S35VN would do better. S35VN is a little tougher. It may not hold an edge as long, but it's it's definitely tougher. The edge will roll before it chips if it's heat, heat treated correctly. Um, and uh, it, it's still very stainless. S35VN is a great steel. Most of the ones I see are all tumbled. This one is tumbled with a satin finish, and it looks great. I would prefer an all tumble blade, but it looks great. The jimping is very deep, but it is functional, and it is not aggressive because it's nicely rounded down. Beautiful. I love that. Thumb studs are very, very easy to interact with. I find it more fun actually to roll this guy out and to flick it. It's super smooth, and I like feeling the slow click right there. I like feeling the clip while my thumb is engaged with that thumb stud, right? The thumb flick is, it's okay, but you get the full effect right there. Ah, yeah, that's nice. Really like that. We've got a flat that carries out about 85% the length of the blade, uh, carrying some very meaningful thickness out there, making the tip an absolute powerhouse, super thick. It can still puncture despite being ultra thick, but here's the cool thing. This actually comes down to a reasonable cutting edge. Unlike, for example, an XM24 Spanto, <laughs> which does not get thin by the edge, this guy gets reasonably thin. Um, it's not insanely thin, right? I mean, you're going to be able to cut, and you're going to be able to cut efficiently. The thumb stud is a little bit in the cutting path, so consider that. You're really only getting about three and a quarter inches of cutting edge, but that's completely fine. No issue there, especially if you're cutting at an angle. That's not going to be a problem. But yeah, the edge geometry is very impressive for how big this knife is. So you actually get decent cutting performance and substantial durability. Let's talk about ergonomics. This knife is insanely comfortable. I think I talked about that in the 8015 review through Cold Steel. You also have an awesome forward choil. It's so easy to engage because there's no flipper tab. So you still have a finger guard, but it just feels so much more natural. This knife has so many wonderful elements, right? This is designed by somebody who knows what he's doing when it comes to hard use, obviously. I know people are like, but he's got nylon. How could he possibly know? He, he just, he does. I... There's too much backing up the design of the cold steel triad lock and it's bajillion different, um, app, you know, how, how many different styles of knives it's been applied to. And then those knives standing up, you know, arguably, you know, understandably for substantially less money than this, right? But again, we're not just, all the money's not just going into durability for every single person who's buying this. And certainly from the maker's standpoint, that's not where, you know, all the money went towards. But he does have that, right? This is an unquestionably durable design, and it is just, it's insanely ergonomic, which complements that, because this is a knife that you would set out to use for long periods of time. If you're wearing gloves, the heavy, deep jimping is going to catch that, but if you're not wearing gloves, it's still, there's still traction there, but it's still comfortable, you know, left or right-handed. And here's the nice thing, guys. 
Lefties rejoice because this is an ambidextrous locking system and the pocket clip is mountable on the other side. So anybody can enjoy this. It's just it's so good. I just really, really, really like the ergonomics and I very much appreciate the ergonomics. Um, it does have a lanyard hole. This is kind of a Spyderco Shaman style pocket clip where the lanyard hole is right in the middle. Um, it does not carry deep. There's a decent amount of this knife sticking up out of your pocket. Perhaps one of the only things that I'll be complaining about. I do love the pocket clip design. It's more of a swoop than it is a bill, which means it gets over the pants pocket easily. To, you know, regardless of wearing, you know, you're not going to be wanting to carry this in sweatpants, but you're probably going to be wearing jeans or heavy duty work pant material carrying this guy, and it's going to be just fine. It is super easy to grab. Give him that little dip there. You pinch here, wherever you grab it, it's going to be just fine. There's just a, you know, big chunk of it kind of sticking up out of your pocket, but the weight and mass of this knife overall is definitely going to keep it in your pocket. And also the general clip retention is going to keep that in your pocket. Um, there does not need to be an insert on this and there obvious for obvious reasons. There doesn't need to be an over travel stop because that's not the style of lock that this is. So um, what are the little things that I can complain about here? Um, the thumb stud is a little bit in the cutting path. The knife is gigantic. That will definitely be a deal breaker for some people. It is gigantic, um, but uh, you know, just because it's not the right knife for you doesn't mean it's a bad design. Some people consider you know, all large knives not good because they're large. <laughs> not every knife is designed to be the Benchmade bug out. So yeah, I, I, it's, it's gonna be too big for some people. Pocket clip doesn't carry super deep. It doesn't need to be deep carry, but it's, it's a little bit shallow carry. Um, what else can I... What else can I complain about here? Um, oh, the uh, of course, I, I have to mention it. I, I personally don't like the nylon washers. I know a lot of people won't. The biggest thing that's gonna turn people off to this is the price. Like I said, the least expensive versions of these that are the actual 8015s, the MG 8015s, uh, start at $675 as far as I can tell. And this particular full titanium variant that's beautiful and surely is catching the eye of many a folk, um, are they're, they're $825. Um, unless, uh, you know, this is a special variant because of the satin blade, but I, I don't believe so. I believe these, these are about 875 bucks. I don't know if, or I'm sorry, 825. I don't know if they go higher than that, but yeah, that's, that's going to be the thing. So is it worth the money? I mean, the, the titanium one truthfully is the one that I would go after me. You guys know, I always spend the extra money, you know, or I've, I've bought my titanium scale for the XM18. So, um, I, I would and have bought um, or paid for titanium to be a part of a knife that is just as functional without it. So can I recommend the this full titanium variant? No. Um, can I recommend the $675 G10 or Micarta one? If you are looking for the most, the absolute most heavy duty folding knife and you want it made 100% in the United States with a lock that is you know easy to manipulate, blah, 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 all the good things that I said, the version of this knife that I can recommend is probably the G10 of Micarta because you're probably getting exactly the same amount of durability um, and fit and finish and blah, blah, blah for substantially less money. So it's really hard because I, I can't actually recommend this particular variant. But for those people, yes, yes, buy it. It's awesome. This knife is awesome. And if you really hate the nylon, I bet you you can find some really inexpensive fossil bronze washers on a secondary market that are made to fit this thing or have some custom made, right? It's, I mean, they, they, you can get phosphor bronze washers for, for knives that don't come with them. You know, I remember when they were making them for Hinder knives in Gen 4 when they didn't have them, which is part of the reason why I'm sure Hinder created the, the, the triway thing. I don't know why I keep talking about Hinder knives. It makes me think of a Hinder. That's why. I, I really like this robust, overbuilt nature, right? Um, yeah, I can recommend it to you. So it's not going on my most recommended knives playlist because truthfully, I just can't, I just can't, right? But it's definitely going on my favorite knives of all time playlist. This thing is awesome. I, I, I really, really like it. So Herms, thanks. Thank you so much for sending this guy along, letting me play with it and enjoy it. I very much have been. Um, this thing's awesome and it'll be coming back to you along with your other stuff here very soon. But anyways, guys, that's going to be pretty much it for today's video. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like. So check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that metal complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.